If everything we've talked about to this point has been review for you, now's the time to start paying attention. In this video, we're going to really learn how to use the periodic table to make powerful predictions of atomic and elemental properties. This is really where the usefulness of the periodic table comes into play. I can't emphasize enough that the ability to use periodic trends is a foundational skill in any chemistry course, general, organic, inorganic, you name it. It will be essentially assumed by the time you get to organic chemistry that you're able to apply periodic trends efficiently. And you'll get the opportunity to practice applying periodic trends, especially in electronegativity and atomic radius, over and over again throughout your chemical education. So the properties we're going to focus on in this video are electronegativity, atomic radius, and ionic radius. Let's begin with electronegativity. A big idea in chemistry, a huge idea, is that chemical bonding and reactivity are all about electrons. Electrons within atoms are held to different degrees of tightness. Different atoms hold their electrons more or less tightly. How tightly an atom holds on to its electrons is referred to as its electronegativity. Linus Pauling, whose picture you see on this slide, defined electronegativity as the tendency of an atom to attract electrons to itself. Rather unsurprisingly at this point, I would hope, atoms display periodic trends in electronegativity. And those trends hold up no matter where we find the atoms. In other words, no matter what molecules we find them in, their electronegativity is transferable from one molecule to another. There are different ways we can measure electronegativity. So we've defined it in a conceptual or qualitative way as this ability of an atom to hold on to electrons or attract electrons to itself. But how can we quantify that? One idea you may have is why don't we just use the ionization energy and or the electron affinity, right? Ionization energy, we understand that as the energy required to knock an electron from the atom, right? So that should be related to electronegativity. Higher ionization energy means higher electronegativity. And electron affinity, well, that's the energy released when an atom gains an additional electron, which seems to be directly correlated with electronegativity as well, right? So we're seeing a single common factor, electronegativity, that's responsible for both ionization energy and electron affinity. And this is the primary reason why these two trends work the same way. Mulliken was one of the earliest to recognize this, and his idea to measure electronegativity and quantify it was simply to take the average of the ionization energy and absolute value of the electron affinity and use that as a measure of electronegativity. That's called the Mulliken electronegativity. Much more common today is Pauling's definition of electronegativity, which uses the bond energy of the bond between X and Y relative to the energy of the bond between X and X. Because a difference in electronegativity strengthens this bond relative to the homoatomic bond XX, we can use the difference between these bond energies to generate a relative electronegativity called the Pauling electronegativity for X and Y. And you can do this for any pair of elements to build up an entire list of relative electronegativities. Pauling electronegativities are much more commonly used today than Mulliken electronegativities. So let's look at periodic trends in Pauling electronegativity. This graphic shows the idea. So the height of each element in this graph is proportional to the electronegativity. And so you can see the trends as we move to kind of taller and taller buildings, if you like, as we move across the periodic table this way. So moving left to right across the period, we see an increase in electronegativity. And as we move up a group, we also see an increase. Fluorine up in the top right of the periodic table is the most electronegative element, attracts electrons most strongly to itself. And francium, poor francium in the bottom left, is the least electronegative. In fact, you sometimes hear this term electropositive used for the elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table. These elements actually want to surrender electrons to form cations, and so they're referred to as electropositive. This is without question the most important periodic trend to understand, electronegativity. We've already seen that ionization energies and electron affinities to a large degree can be explained by electronegativity. We can also make powerful predictions of reactivity using ideas of electronegativity alone. If you only remember one thing from Chem 1000, remember this. Electronegativity increases left to right across a period and decreases moving down a group. What about atomic radius? Well, naively, 
As we add more electrons to the atom, it seems like the atomic radius should increase, right? We're just adding more electrons to the atom, and so they should take up more space, in theory, right? But the evidence argues otherwise. This is very interesting. Watch what happens, for example, across the second period from lithium to fluorine. Atomic radius actually decreases. Now, when we go from fluorine to sodium, we see the usual jump, either up or down, and here it's a large jump up in atomic radius. Same idea for chlorine to potassium and bromine to rubidium. We get these large jumps. But down a group, atoms do indeed get bigger. The other thing we can notice is that fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, for example, within the halogens, increasing in size as we move down a group. But across a period, atoms actually get smaller. So what's, what's going on there? And remember, the ionization energies kind of suggest that as well. Ionization energy increases as we move across a group, even though added electrons that seem like would be farther from the nucleus. But how do we explain this? Here's a graphic that shows you the idea. Atoms do indeed get larger as we move down a group, but they actually get smaller as we move across a period like this. Well, ionization energies tell us that as we add a proton and electron, the new electron goes into the same shell unless that shell is full. And at which point that shell is full, the new electron is placed much farther from the nucleus. So if a shell is not completely full, the new electron is added at about the same distance as the other electrons in the valence or outermost shell. But if an additional proton has been added to the nucleus, the nuclear charge is greater. And so all of the electrons are pulled closer to the nucleus by the additional proton. Let's think about this graphically. If I have, say, three electrons in the outermost shell of an atom, and I add a fourth electron. Well, I also added another proton to the nucleus. So all of the electrons are gonna be drawn closer to the nucleus by this additional positive charge. And because the new electron has been added into the same shell as the original three, the entire shell gets pulled closer to the nucleus. This is the origin of the decreasing size as we move from left to right across the periodic table. Another way to put this is that the effective nuclear charge, the effective charge of the nu nucleus, increases due to the additional proton. And the added electron in the same vicinity as the other electrons does a bad job of shielding the charge due to the additional proton. Here's a nice graphic for thinking about effective nuclear charge. The nucleus has some positive charge here. But each electron doesn't feel the full force of that positive charge, right? Since each electron is repelled by, for example, core electrons. Electrons beyond or outside of, say, the electron of interest, have no impact on attraction between the nucleus and the electron since they're on the outside. They're not between the electron of interest and the nucleus. But the electrons in between do cancel some of the nuclear charge. This is an important effect that's known as shielding. The electron of interest does not feel the full nuclear charge, Z, because of the repulsive shielding effect of electrons between the electron of interest and the nucleus. But what we can say is that Z effective, the effective nuclear charge, is less than the full nuclear charge, Z. As we add electrons within a shell, as we move left to right across the periodic table, these actually have a minimal shielding effect on electrons that are already in the atom, right? Since they're found at about the same distance or farther out than all of the previous electrons that were there. And so the additional proton that we find in the nucleus causes all of the electrons to pull in closer and a decrease in atomic size. What about ionic radius? Well, it's important to gain an intuition for the sizes of ions, especially relative to neutral atoms. What we find is that atoms within a group tend to form the same types of ions with similar charges. We can ask how do the radii of these ions compare down a group and across a period. Across a period you'll notice that the ions formed increase or decrease in charge by one. So lithium plus, beryllium two plus, boron three plus, oxygen two minus, fluorine two minus. Universally, cations are smaller than the corresponding neutral atoms because cations have lost one or more electrons relative to the neutral atom, and so the effective nuclear charge, if you like, of the nucleus is much larger. That electron can't engage in shielding. It does not cause any sort of repulsive forces. 
and so all of the remaining electrons get pulled in tighter to the nucleus. Anions are larger than neutral atoms because they've gained one or more electrons relative to the neutral atom. And notice you can see that here in the figure in the bottom right. The cations are smaller and the anions are larger. That additional electron causes a decrease in the effective nuclear charge and engages in repulsive forces, enlarging the size of the atom. And do note that the ion formed follows a pattern as we mentioned before, plus one, plus two, plus three, Plus four and minus three are not shown in the figure, but we do see those for groups 14 and 15, and then minus two and minus one. Notice what happens as we move from left to right. The ions get smaller, especially the cations. The effect is largest, uh, for example, it's very clear in this period right here. Rubidium plus, strontium two plus, and indium three plus getting smaller and smaller. Why does this happen? Well, notice the charges. Rubidium plus is larger than strontium two plus, is larger than indium three plus. There's a correlation between the charge and the size of the cation. And this should make sense in light of Coulomb's law, right? The larger the charge is in the nucleus, the stronger is the attractive force of that nucleus on all the electrons within the atom. So as we go to larger charges, indium three plus, we get smaller ions as the electrons are pulled in closer to the more highly positively charged nucleus. Remarkably, the same effect happens for the anions as we go to lesser charge. The effect here is much less because typically the difference, the electron that makes the difference is a valence electron that's far from the nucleus that doesn't make much difference to the effective nuclear charge. But it's a similar idea here that in F minus, the effective charge of the F nucleus is greater than the effective nuclear charge of the oxygen nucleus in O2 minus. So this is similar in spirit to the trend in atomic radii in that the piece that is essential to understand is the effective nuclear charge of the atom. The effective positive charge due to the nucleus, which comes from the nuclear charge itself, minus any shielding due to electrons between electrons of interest and the nucleus. Finally, I want to talk briefly about why it's important to learn periodic trends. Very common pattern in chemistry is the idea of reasoning by analogy. We want to use data, use experiments, use knowledge that we have already to either make predictions or construct hypotheses about the results of experiments we're about to do or we want to plan on doing. We want to use knowledge, for example, of one element to predict the properties of another. Given two elements in the same group, what are their relative electronegativities? Given two elements in the same period, what are their relative ionic radii? These are the kinds of questions that periodic trends can help us answer. Why is this important? Well, because sometimes changing a single atom to leverage periodic trends can have powerful effects. Here's an example from an organometallic research group. They ran a reaction with a palladium catalyst with two molecules of what's called butadiene. That's the molecule with two double bonds that you see in the center of the slide. When they used a palladium catalyst, they got the linear product that you see on the right. But when they switched the palladium atom with a smaller nickel atom, they got a cyclic product, the one you see on the left. And this is due, they attributed it to, the difference in atomic size between nickel and palladium. There's a difference of about 13 picometers there. That smaller nickel catalyst enabled the cyclization where the larger palladium atom prevented it. 